Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Andy Lopata. Andy is author, professional speaker, and professional relationship strategist, and he's actually authored five books. He's also the host of a great podcast, which we'll hear a little bit about because I really want to encourage people to check it out. Uh, but uh, Andy, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for inviting me on, Jono. So 
uh, can you tell our listeners, I obviously gave a quick intro there of a few things you do, but tell, tell us in a bit more detail about what you do, Andy. Yeah, I, I'm a, as you say, I'm a professional relationship strategist. So what that means is I work with my clients who range in size, predominantly multinational companies, uh, some, some smaller businesses as well. Uh, I, I work with them on enabling them to harness the power of their professional relationships. So enabling them to build networks with the right people uh, that are going to drive their career or their business forward helping them to nurture those relationships so that they have strong, authentic relationships. This isn't about manipulating people. It's not about using people or pretending to be someone you're not. It's about being authentic and being yourself, uh, but with, uh, you know, with, with a commercial focus, if you like, uh, and also to leverage those relationships. So from leveraging can be anything from generating referrals, winning more influence, uh, it can be mentoring. Uh, I do a lot of work on mentoring with various clients. Uh, and, and my last book was about vulnerability and the importance of asking for help. So enabling that network to help and support you. Yeah, that's great. I love uh, I love what you do. I think it's uh, really interesting and, and really important. Uh, I, I know our listeners really appreciate hearing people's stories. So I always enjoy asking this question. Let's start with you know, Andy growing up, if you think back to your childhood in that season, are there any moments that really stand out or any themes from that season of your life that you've seen shape you to become the person and leader you are today? Well, well, there's a few things. It's a really interesting question. I think there's a few things both, both had a positive influence and negative experiences that, you know, you can question how they've influenced me. Uh, I, I, I was a drama uh, student as a kid um, went to to weekly drama classes and dance classes uh, and, and it was something I really took to and was good at uh, I, I normally had the lead role in our plays and in our school plays often as well uh, and I was asked to audition for the Royal Shakespeare Company when I was about 14 I think um, so that was something that's really shaped what I do as a professional speaker um, it, it's it's certainly given me grounding uh, there and also the confidence that you need to, to do the type of work that I have over the years. Um, so, so that certainly, you know, I went on from, from I, I, I gave up on drama when I was about 16 and discovered girls on football uh, and lost my interest in, in drama <laughs> and was a little bit of a prima donna as well. And, and uh, I didn't get the lead role in a play and I thought, right, I'm going to football on Saturdays instead. Um but uh, I then in sixth form at college, so our college in the UK and then at university, I was in our debating society and, and I, I represented the university uh, debating team in an international competition. So all of that certainly helped me uh, in my career. I, I mentioned negative as well. I, I, I wasn't physically the, the, the strongest kid. Uh, I, I'm short now. I was very short. Um, I had asthma and eczema. I was bullied incessantly. And I think that's given me a, a deep desire to prove all of those bullies wrong and to, to be better than them. Uh, and it's driven a very competitive instinct and competitive with myself. Um, so... Uh, you know, I've not done the psychotherapy that might uncover layers, but I think that that has given me, it's shaped my personality that's shaped how I am and what I do to a large degree. Yeah, absolutely. I, well, I'm so sorry to hear about that experience, but I, I appreciate how you're describing that, like you said, and it's a great answer to the question that some of those challenges uh, when you were growing up, you can sort of see the fruit of that is there's, it developed in you a um, you know part of your com uh, competitive instinct and wanting to prove those people wrong. Um, yeah, I think maybe it drives a certain resilience as well, um, and gives you a, a thicker skin. You, you 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 know when you run your own business, particularly everything that the world has thrown at us in the last fourteen fifteen years, uh, when you're trying to you know from basically. We, we started this business in 2007 and then had to crash in 2008. 
So this particular business has seen uh, a global financial crash, Brexit, a pandemic, uh, and now war in Europe. So you need resilience to uh, keep keep your head <laughs> up and keep working through all of that and, and keep trying to build a business. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's incredible when you list it like that. It is um, resilience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So looking back to... I guess uh, when you were a teenager and then into your 20s, um, and it might have been even younger than that, but do you remember your first chance to really lead as in uh, where you had a group of people that you were responsible for or where you were leading a project or casting vision? Do you remember your first chance to really do something like that? Yes. So after I left university, I joined the civil service. On my first day in my job, uh, my manager said to me, what are you doing at this grade with your um, with your qualifications? You should be at least the next grade up. And I've already told you about that competitiveness I had developed. So I spent the next two years applying for promotions <laughs> without trying to prove that I was worth it because I felt entitled to it. Um, I, I got the promotion and I walked into a job with a team of people where it was my first managerial position I'd have been about 22 I had a team of people many of whom had been in their job longer than I'd been alive in a civil service environment which doesn't wow. really tolerate uh, different opinions and change you know you, this is the way we do it because we've always done it this way and that definitely wasn't my personality and i ended up at one point they did a restructure of our department so so our department we had about a third of the, of the department were my grade and the other two thirds uh, generally were below that grade um and at the time when i started we each had a couple of people that we were responsible for but then they restructured the department and gave me half of the team that, that were below us and one other person at my grade, the other half. And suddenly I, I'm 22 years old and I've got a team of, I don't, I can't remember how many, 20, 25 people, uh, many of whom, as I say, were twice my age or more, <laughs> been in that job wow. longer than I'd been alive, didn't like different opinions and it was hard. I learned <laughs> a lot and I wasn't, I wasn't carved out for that role. I definitely wasn't. Um, it, it was a tough learning curve. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that because um, I don't know. I've certainly found for me that those times are, are pretty horrible. Like they tend to be. Uh, you, you think I, for me anyway. You think well, I don't know if that was a stretching time or a breaking time. <laughs> like it's uh, there are moments where it's incredibly hard, um, and yet you learn so much. Do you have any favorite failures or mistakes from that season that you think back to and go, "Wow, that's become core Andy philosophy because of what you learnt." Well, I think there's a couple of them. I, I should just add as an aside that it, it, when you say it was stretch or break, um, it was break. I mean, I became, you know, I ended my relationship. I became, I, I was just so out of shape uh, and so stressed. And I ended up quitting and no one quit the civil service at that grade and travelling to Australia for 15 months. Uh, Australia and South Africa for 15 months. So that was my outcome from that. Um, but, but in terms of a, a couple of moments... Uh, one of them was when I had a member of my team. This is when we had the smaller team. So I had a team of about five at this point. Uh, and a member of my team was a very softly spoken, very deferential uh, Asian guy who would have been, I guess, in his 50s at that time. Um, and I wanted to encourage him. I, I've never liked deference for the for deference's sake um you know when people don't really share what they're thinking but they just nod and smile uh and that was very much his approach and when it came to his appraisal i wanted to encourage him to do more to 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 bit to stand up for himself a bit more to to speak up to to sh you know to to show his share his own thoughts which he never did and that led to an accusation of, of racial discrimination, um, which it never was, and it, and it never wow. stood up. Um, yeah. But, but, but it was, I think, looking back, it, it, it was probably my first experience of having to learn cultural differences 
because I, I would say looking back now that was a cultural thing uh, and understand not everyone's the same and and actually not just cultural differences but differences in ambition maybe he didn't want to move up a level maybe he was happy in what he was doing um, I, I don't think it, he he and his wife who, who my colleague told me was behind the complaint um, who also worked there uh, I don't think they handled it very well and, and you know, very fairly, but that's, yeah. you know, I don't hold a grudge. It's a long, long time ago. Um, yeah. But it, it was a learning point. And the other was um, about the line between friendship and uh, work roles. Um, so I, I was in my early 20s. I had a couple of girls on my team who were maybe 18, 19. And, of course, I'm going to gravitate to them a lot more than I am to my colleagues who were 40, 50 and so forth. Um, and I got very close to them. I mean, one of them opened up to me a lot um, about, you know, a lot of very personal stuff uh, as, her, as her boss, but also someone she felt she could confide in. But when it came to their appraisals, my colleagues who, who used my team as their resource, they wanted me to give them a very bad appraisal and I didn't think it was merited and I think I was just too close to them and too close to the situation to be in that role. So I think that there was an element of that as well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it was... Uh, and, and actually, there is one other thing, and that is that in, throughout my 20s, um, I rubbed people up the wrong way wherever I worked. Um, and it's ironic, I teach professional relationships now, but I'm older and wiser. Um, but I would be very quick to question, very quick to challenge... Uh, and, and I think that's probably the main thing I took out from it all that, that really is relevant to, to what I do now is I, don't, I didn't play politics. I was very blunt. And when you're in a civil, a, 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 an environment like the civil service, that doesn't go down well. And, I mean, that carried right the way through till I was 29 um, where I didn't really have that filter of how other people saw me and how other people received my message. I just had the passion to speak my mind and it wasn't really conducive to good relationships with colleagues. Yeah, that's, um, thank you for sharing about uh, those stories. I'm interested to know with, with what you know now, so many years later, how would you have approached both of those situations differently? So if you're walking into those situations now, what, what have you learned about how to navigate, you know, that uh yeah both of those situations you mentioned what would you do differently now well i think if you take the second one first the the, the two young women so, so the one who was sharing very personal stuff i i think you know one thing for me is i i almost became took a mentor role which i think it's great if line managers do um but i that maybe there's a line there where you have to say look, I, I'm happy to support you in this, but you do recognise that I also have to play this role and maybe find someone else who she could open up to and trust that I could refer her to for certain elements of the conversation. And I'd still be friendly with the two of them, but, you know, remember my professional role in the way that I would engage with them. Um, so I think just a little bit more... Um, clear water between us not not hugely and not to be unpleasant but just a little bit more clear water between us and and, and i think waiting you know i remember from from those days that one of the clear messages from hr was that a, you should have continuous appraisal nothing should come as a surprise um when it comes to the appraisal process i think looking back in hindsight um I would want to be sounding out a lot of those colleagues in advance to, un you know, throughout the year to understand what they wanted from my team and what they were delivering. Uh, and maybe before going into those appraisal processes, having more conversations um, with those colleagues uh, about what they expected and why and debate more openly where, where I was coming from. And I think that would have helped with the first situation as well, because I don't think I took it because at that time, um, the, 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 the person who put the complaint in was working solely for me on my team. He wasn't a shared resource across many people at my grade, which, which happened in the latter incident. So, but I think that 
uh, particularly given the level of experience I had, having a conversation with my boss about what I wanted to say in that situation may well have um, prevented the issue that arose. Yeah, there's some good things that you mentioned there. I um, I love that idea of uh, how did you put it about um, uh, the continuous uh, appraisal? Was that the language you used? Yeah, um, I can't remember what word I used, but yes, ongoing appraisal. You know, <laughs> ongoing they appraisal. Be surprised. Yeah, yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that because that's one of my um, in. Uh, you know, I've I've written a book about how to deal with difficult people called Step Up or Step Out that I try not to uh, bang on about too much on the podcast. Um, it's in the intro and outro yeah. for people who listen about it. But um, it's funny you mention that because one of the things I talk about in the book a lot is this idea of no surprises. I feel like surprise is a great litmus test for leaders that if you see surprise in someone's eyes that you are leading the then um you know the question unless you're surprising them with a with a wonderful bonus um the rest of the time it's a warning sign because you need to ask what is it what is it i haven't done like why is this coming as a surprise and i think so often it's because we couldn't find the right moment there's all these good reasons or excuses but when someone's surprised it i feel like it makes everything else so much harder in that relationship yeah, yeah, and it's a it's a very good point. It's a very important point, and that's where, when you're looking at professional relationships, communication is so key. Um, and in my case, I, I throughout my twenties, I was rubbing people up the wrong way without knowing it because no one told me. When I was twenty nine, yeah. someone told me, and I was able to take action on it, and, and things changed. I hope I still manage to do it every now and then. <laughs> That's so good. Um, I'm interested to know, can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? How did someone give you that feedback in a way that obviously uh, has ended up being helpful for you? Well, well, actually, it was my father. So when I, I quit my last corporate job when I was 29 with the goal of being a freelance writer, and my dad had just set up um, networking groups with a business partner, and he invited me to come and earn a bit of pocket money while I got some writing commissions by helping them uh, launch launch the organisation. It was six months old at the time. And I ended up immersed in that. That's how I got into this world. Um, and it got to the point where as we grew, I was going along to various groups and, and supporting them. And he just pulled me to, to one side at a time. And he said, look, you're going into, we had a group in Mayfair. In, in you know the the heart of of the west end of london and it was chaired by a partner at a very prestigious law firm and he said you're going to this group full of people who are vastly more experienced than you and you're telling them what to do and that includes the chairman of the group who's a partner in a top law firm and you're telling him what to do they don't like it and that was the home truth i needed to hear uh, and, and it was from that point that I learned um, to to just rein it in a little bit more. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's good. Thank you for sharing that um, little anecdote about about how how your dad did that. Um, <clears throat> further along in your career and in your public speaking and with your uh, the five books you've written, I'm interested in the big aha moments you've had. You know those moments where. They really stick in your memory. Maybe you've written about them in, in your books. Uh, they're a line in the sand, turning point, uh, where the penny really drops about an idea. Any of the moments that you can share with us? Um, yeah, there are probably a load of them. I'm nothing springing to, to mind immediately. But, um, I mean, I think the, the one that I've just shared is, is a good example of an aha moment in terms of my own personal growth. In terms yeah. of, of what I share and, and, and what I cover, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's a constant pattern. You know, I'm constantly developing my material and engaging because I see things happening and it makes me recognise something that's, that's going on. I think it, it may not quite fit the bill of what you say, but it's it, something that in terms of how I develop material, um, one particularly unusual one came in 2019 when... I um, I had decided to reposition 
what I do because I, I've talked for years about networking and the problem with talking about networking, you know, I would, I would start my talks by saying network is networking isn't this and it isn't that because people think of networking and they think of networking events. And I, I was interested in so much more than that. And, uh, I, 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 I gave up my battle to redefine networking and instead talked about uh, professional relationships. So I re redefined, repositioned what I do. And I was due to deliver a talk uh, or a training session for a group of people at uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, one, one day. And it was an early start. Uh, you know, I think it was a nine o'clock start. Uh, for those of you who know, if you know the geography of London, it was around the other side of the M25, which is not an easy place to get to for a nine o'clock start. Um, so it meant a very early um, wake up and, and get on that motorway before it got too busy. And and when that happens, I don't sleep very well anyway, because my body's thinking I've got to get up earlier and I've got to be fresh. Um, and I went to bed and I was lying in bed and I, I started coming up with a new model um to 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 um show how to create the right network and to to create the right connections so i quickly got up and i wrote it down on a post-it note and then i went back to bed and then i came up with a new model of how professional relationships look and i quickly got up again and i wrote it down on a post-it note and i just couldn't sleep and i ended up um sort of half the night riding out and developing these new models and I went to deliver the training the next day. And when I got to a certain point in the session, I said, do you want the stuff that I had prepared in advance and I've been delivering for years and, and I know inside out, or do you want the stuff I, I, I developed last night when I couldn't sleep? And everyone chose the latter and, and they've become the core of the work that I do now. Um, so it was very unusual. Uh, and I know there's creativity <laughs> experts that say that's not unusual, that you know when your brain's you know creates the space it becomes more creative and, and that's a, a good environment to do that as is, as is the shower for example you know uh, yeah. a, an old friend of mine uh, who sadly passed away a number of years ago used to talk in his presentations he was a creativity expert about keeping um uh, wipeable marker pens in the shower and writing on the tiles when you got an idea so that you didn't forget it um so I guess it's not unusual in that sense, but it was unusual for me, but it has actually become the core of the work that I do now. That's incredible. Uh, it's funny because I have a, uh, a similar sort of story, which is uh, where the, the ideas that I, that I had, um, it's actually for a book that I am writing. So I haven't actually mm. released it yet, but it's about, um, it's about how to empower and delegate. And it's funny because I had a similar thing where I remember being so frustrated with, uh, and, and I had all these different ideas that I was working on, but, um, I just remember one day having this aha moment of, um, an initial idea and I'd really been stuck and I actually, I was walking somewhere. I remember I need, I needed to go somewhere and I was walking. So it's a bit like that when your brain yeah. has nothing else to do. And I was actually just thinking, man, how do I, how do I solve this problem? And the big problem was how do you delegate well without really dropping stuff on people that buries them, but also at the same time without carrying stuff too much yourself that buries you. It's like, there's got to be this, this halfway point or this process. And then I just started having these ideas and I just was jotting them down in my phone um, and they became the core of that framework. And I remember just on this walk over about 10 minutes, the core ideas of that. It's amazing how that happens. And I would love to know how to prompt that to happen more often. But it's pretty, for me anyway, those sort of really clear, innovative ideas, I feel like they're a bit few and far between for me anyway. Yeah, I, I, as I, I have managed to continually uh, evolve and, and innovate new ideas uh, over the years, but a lot of the time it just tends to be I'm delivering a presentation and I'll say something because I don't script everything. So on a training session or a presentation, I'll say something and I'll realise I've come up with a new idea. Um, uh, or or some, uh, someone in the audience will say something and you get into a conversation on that and it develops a new idea. Um, so I, I haven't had many sea change ideas like that. I mean, that shifted 
uh, it, it took everything I do to a new level. Um, and you don't want too many of those uh, because you then want to <laughs> yeah, live and those ideas and, and, and go deeper. I have actually gotten a harm, an, an actual aha moment in the sense that you're talking about that, that uh, hadn't come to mind uh, at that point when you asked ask the question. Um, yeah. But and it, it might be in line with, with uh, similar to, to the topic that you're working on at the moment from what you've just said. Um, but I in I would say it's about 2014, 15, I would guess. I um, Our business was really struggling. Uh, we got to a point where we were within about £400 of our overdraft limit. And people were saying, what's next? You know, what's your plan B? And I was like, there's no plan B. And I'm a member of the Professional Speaking Association. And I have been for many years. 2003, I joined. And I a lot of my best friends not just in business but a lot of my best friends come from that community it's our tribe and i was at psa meetings and in the uh, networking session before you go in people were saying how's business and i was saying yeah it's good it's fine and i i was at one in reading which is just outside london not far from heathrow and uh, we had a master class before the uh, before the formal meeting, and the guy that ran it, Stephen Houghton Burnett, gave us all a questionnaire to fill in before we started, and it had a series of questions, and, and two of the questions were the same, one for your speaking business and one for your non-speaking business, and it was how would you describe it, and it had four options: growing, stable, in decline, or new. And so I ticked the boxes and I, I, I would hope I ticked in decline because <laughs> there was no other way to describe where we were at that time. And then when he started the session, he went through all of the answers or all of the questions on, the, on the, the survey and he asked people to share their answers. And when he said, how would you describe your business? You know, those two questions. He asked people to put their hands up for what they ticked and hands went up for every single option other than in decline. So I didn't stick my hand up and no one did. And it was then that I realised how much we go around lying about how we are or how business is, even to people we trust. And by doing that, we don't let people help us. And, and I, I made a commitment mm. to myself at that, that point that I would turn the business around with the help of other people. And then I would deliver a, the keynote talk or a keynote talk at the Professional Speaking Association convention when the business was turned around because everyone wants a happy ending. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. I turned the business around with the help of other people and I delivered a talk in the 2016 PSA convention called, at the time it was called Bigger <laughs> Than You, as in you are bigger than just you. You've got all these people around you, but if you don't let them know what help you need, they can't help you. Uh, and it had a massive impact. You know, the response was phenomenal. I got an email from one member in the northwest of England who said, I've just sent this email to every member in, in, in my region and I wanted to share it with you. And, and he'd shared everything that was going on um, and that he'd been keeping quiet to that stage. And there were lots of stories like that. And that that was something that I then went to deliver for PayPal, who were a client of mine. Uh, and I realised there was more, but... I didn't feel qualified to talk about it, so I wrote a book. Because for me, the best way to, to learn about something is to write a book about it. And I interviewed about 50 people from all over the world, um, from experts in particular related topics to senior politicians. And we, uh, there's a chapter about do we allow our politicians to be vulnerable um, to a former New York Bronx gang member. Uh, leading sports people, you know, you name it, all around the world, and got their stories, uh, and, and that took three years to write. Came out in in during the pandemic, uh, called by now, now it's called Just Ask. Um, so yeah, it was a real aha moment. Wow. It was I'm not I, I'm I'm wearing a mask, and I didn't realise I was doing it, and that led to um, a whole a whole part of my business now is, is on vulnerability. My new talk is is vulnerable leadership, so wow. it's now extending into leadership so that all came from that meeting in in reading incredible yeah that's um that's such a great story thank you for sharing that and i love 
what you just said, wearing a mask without realizing it, because I think mm. that uh, there's a great message in there. It's an angle on vulnerability that isn't talked about much, actually, so I can see why it's being received so well, Andy. Thank you. Uh, so as we as we draw to a close, I want to ask you some Leadership Express questions. So the first one is, what is a book that you've gifted to others, Andy? There are quite a few books that I've recommended to others. There are a couple that I've gifted. One of them is written by a friend of mine. It's a lady called Joe Simpson, um, and it's called The Restless Executive. And what Joe did was create a novel a story that got across her her work which is on core values and it's about someone who's unhappy in their role um and their journey to finding uh, a role that they are happy with and i mean this is quite a few years ago i read the book and i remember having sleepless nights because i'll read at the end of the day and I, said, I see a pattern of sleepless nights here. I have work to address that, by the way. <laughs> um, but I, I'll often read at the end of the day. And <laughs> Joe's book is not a book to read at the end of the day because it throws up so many questions and it really makes you uh, look at your life and look at your, your, your job, your work, and, and how it serves you. Um, and I think that any book that gets you tossing and turning to that degree because it's got into your mind and you're really thinking it through that has massive impact so uh the restless executive by joe simpson um is definitely one i give mm. away on more than one occasion yeah that's great uh, great recommendation thank you what is a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or been reminded of a uh, recent leadership lesson that I've learned for the first time or been reminded of. Can we come back to that one? Let me mull that one over. I haven't, I haven't had pre-sight of the questions. And I normally, I, I normally don't look anyway. Um, <laughs> these are these are those two that's where you really right. probably want to think think them through um, first. No, but, no, um, that's okay. We'll yeah, <laughs> we'll, 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 it's meant come, to be like a coffee let's chat. Let's come so back we're... to it. Let's come back to it. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm always learning, and there's always something new. It's just <laughs> picking out that lesson. Um, I, actually. Yeah, no, yeah. I can give you something, and it, it's not something I one. didn't know. <laughs> it, it's not something I didn't know, but it is reinforcement, and it, yeah. it, it, it's actually modelling mm -hmm. great behaviour. And, and it, it's I'm a little bit uncomfortable sharing it because I know there are people in my industry who think it's too early to to analyse um, what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, you know, from a, a, a professional perspective, you know, from a speaker's perspective, if you like. Um, but actually, I, I think, you know, we analyse these things all along. It, it doesn't mean that we don't feel for what's happening and, and the, the, the hideous um, things that are going on behind it that drive it. Um, but uh, Vladimir Zelensky, president of Ukraine, delivered talks to um, the UK Parliament and the US Congress uh, not long before we're recording this episode. Um, and I think he's also just spoken to the Indian Congress for not wrong and, and, and done something similar. But he would have been perfectly within his rights to stand there and just talk about Ukraine and just talk about what they're going through and what they need from the West you know, from the UK, from the US, and if I'm right about India, from India. Uh, but he didn't do that. He, he, he did deliver that message, but he delivered it using the language and references that would resonate with each audience. So when he spoke to the UK Parliament, he channeled Churchill and he, he made references, you know, that, that, that those parliamentarians would recognise as archetypally British, part of British culture. Uh, when he spoke to Congress, he channeled Martin Luther King. He talked about having a dream. He channeled Pearl Harbor. He talked about 9-11. And I think when he did, he spoke to the, the Indian Congress, I'm really battling with myself because I think it was the Indian Congress, I'm not sure, but he did the same thing again. And, and he channeled references that, that would make sense to them. Um, and, and I think, as I say, it's not something I didn't know because it's something that I teach. Um, but I think I can't remember seeing someone so consistently under so much pressure 
in such a situation where they didn't even need to do that Ch role model um crafting a message that resonates with your audience rather than just saying what you want to say in such a brilliant way um so it's not a, a, an exact answer to your questions but I, I hope that's a useful answer to the question yeah that's a great answer thank you uh, a, a really good example um what is a movie or tv show that really impacted you it may be something serious um or it may be something really light that's a switch off sort of thing but it's it's really one of your favorites um oh, there's so much good content now the um you know my favorites will shift <laughs> uh, month to month because there's so many good things that come out i mean i'm a big fan of the, the the shows that get a lot of um a lot of the good press you know the breaking bad better call Saul, succession billions i just started the last uh or the latest series of billions last night and, and i'm looking forward to really sort of diving straight back into that great acting great scripting going further back things like the west wing uh er uh, even further back uh hill street blues you know so all of those classic series um more recently there's a series i'm trying to think of the name um read the book afterwards as well series on um amazon Pro no not amazon prime uh, apple tv about the opioid crisis in the us um and i cannot think of the name of it um off the top of my head it's with michael keaton's in it um and it it just opened my eyes to something that i i was aware of but i didn't really understand mm. Um, and, you know, I'd heard about the opioid crisis. I'd heard about the Sackler family. Um, but that series really, really drove me to find out more. I read the book on which it was based. I then went and read a book, um, one of the top books of last year, about the Sackler family and the history of it. Um, and it, it was it, it, it was really eye-opening. And I think there's a lot of series like that. So that. But that's a recent one for me. And it's frustrating me. I can't think of the name of it. I think it begins with a D, but it's just... Oh, uh, is it... Uh, dope sick dope sick? dope sick yes thank you yes dope sick yes um, so, so yeah really that's, a, that's dope sick. great yeah it, it, it's it's brilliantly acted it's it's very well scripted um when you read the book dope sick you can see a lot of um a lot of the, the series in there um the other book I read again. I'm doing well. We are eight o'clock in the morning when we're recording this, so for me, so that's my excuse for not remembering. <laughs> you are doing well. <laughs> that and I'm getting old. Um, but the, the other book on the Sackler family, which was one of the top books last year, um, I, I think is 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 a better read. Um, and Dope Sick gets very technical about the uh, the book. Gets very technical about the opioid crisis. Um, but but that's that's a series that really impacted me. And then there's another one. The fourth series has just come on, and again it's it's a series based on a book. Uh, both are wonderful, particularly the first series, which is really fits with the book. And that's my brilliant friend, which is an Italian series, uh, originally an Italian book, and it's just beautiful. Uh, it, it just is um, uh, beautiful writing and beautiful television. Um, so that that's just a really great escape and, and, and I love I, I've had to look up the the other book on the Sackler dynasty it's Empire of Pain uh, by Patrick Keefe yeah fantastic okay last question Andy what is uh, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader what would you say one piece of leadership advice to a young leader is lead lead from within not from without and by that i i mean i, I think mm. there's classical vision of leadership of the leader standing on the mountain and uh telling everyone else you know what to do or leading from the front and telling everyone else um they must follow them um don't look for followers look for people to go on the journey with you so when i say lead from within lead from within the pack Build your team around you. Be vulnerable. Be open. Don't think that just because you're a leader, you need to know all the answers. Mm. Your job as a leader isn't to know yeah, the answer. Good. Your job as a leader is to find the right answer and then make the ultimate decision. But you find the right answer mm. with the help of everyone around you, and that includes your team. Uh, and that, that, that being vulnerable and being part of the team and, and taking them on the journey with you 
um, is much more powerful than pretending to know everything and making the same mistakes that everyone else has already made in the past because you're too arrogant to uh, to admit you don't know. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, I love it. <laughs> really good thoughts there, Andy. Uh, for those who've really appreciated today and want to uh, follow you online, find you online, uh, maybe get your get your books and also uh, check out your podcast. Can you let everyone know where they can, the different ways people can find you online? Yeah, sure. The The easiest way is to go to my Linktree page because that link lists all of my links and that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Andy Lapata. Uh, so that's Linktree with a dot before the second two E's forward slash Andy Lapata. If you're a podcast listener, which I guess you are, uh, <laughs> given where you're hearing this, uh, it's the Connected Leadership <laughs> yep. Podcast. So it's the Connected Leadership Podcast, uh, either on your, any podcast provider or go to podfollow.com forward slash Connected Leadership. Uh, all of my books are on Amazon and all of the other uh, bookstores. They're all um, order. You can order them depending on where you are in the world. You should be able to order them from your local bookstore um uh, or go to the link tree and get the links to my site from there wonderful well i want to thank our listeners for tuning in um great thoughts today and wonderful stories from andy and i know there'll be a bunch of people really keen to check out andy's podcast and books just because i love that idea of vulnerable leadership and um just that one story about uh where just ask really came out of was was really profound um, uh, don't forget for our listeners, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, where you can go and continue to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Andy, for being so generous with your time, uh, for sharing uh, some wonderful stories and, and wisdom with us. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much again for inviting me on, John o. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review 
and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.